Ironside will not be seen tonight, so we may bring you the following special program. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. That's, uh, you know, me kind of doing a very light take on the version of Batman I was raised by, you know, which is sort of post Neil Adams' take, which he was doing the year I was born. Um, Neil Adams was redefining the character kind of in the cracks and corners of DC when he was first a cover artist on a lot of the uh, Batman books in the late 60s and then once they gave him sort of the run of the place um, his look he kind of exaggerated even more with the uh, the lighting and the grandeur the way he would exaggerate the figure form the length of the ears the um, the length of the cape, um, a lot of it was just sort of aesthetics. He wasn't really changing the costume per se. I tried to illustrate what Adams did with a sense of maybe somewhat photo exacting kind of take on it, while also kind of avoiding some of the comic book tropes of the glowing white eyes, which I was always having a problem with as a kid, thinking about like how the mask is pretty much on his face like it's makeup. Like it's as close to the skin as you can get the way it was drawn by everybody, Adams included. And if that's the case, there's no room to hide the eyelashes for the human being wearing this mask. So basically just his natural eyes showing, but you can hide that in shadow. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Man, I've been wanting to talk to this guy for a really, really long time, and I'm really glad that our stars have aligned and we can finally have this conversation. He's entertained us in comics. He's entertained us in animation and live action as well. It's great to welcome Christopher Yost to Word Balloon. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. I'm super excited to be on here. I This is fantastic. I've, I've never been on anything like this. Oh, wow. That's surprising. Uh, given your body of work, I'm surprised some of us nerds haven't hit you up uh, for uh, for a podcast or a video interview before. Well, I mean, they have and I, I've, I've done a few, but they haven't been quite this polished. This is uh, this is. Fantastic. Oh, you're very... <laughs> well, that's very kind. I really appreciate that, man. Uh, well, we can say the same about your fine work as well. Uh, I'm very, very excited for uh this uh, this new book that you've got coming out in October from Vault, and it's Unnatural Order. Um, this is really neat, um, and this is your first this is your first Vault comic, I'm assuming. How man, it's been a while since you've done comics, period, hasn't it? I've done a couple of random things, but the last real like book book I did was it was like a Secret Wars crossover, like Jonathan Hickman's Secret Wars, and I did like a random Modoc series, like a Battle World tie-in. And it was super yeah. fun, but, uh, but yeah, that was like my last like real like comic. Uh, I did one issue of a Deadpool like black and white that I thought was the best thing I've ever written, but uh, it was uh, Deadpool fighting the Kool Aid Man basically, and uh, it turned out pretty well. But uh, That's yeah, cool. I haven't done like a comic in a long time. I certainly haven't done an original like creator owned in a long time, and. I've been working with vaults on the the film side uh, for a little bit, and this idea kind of had been percolating for a long time. And I told it to them, and they uh, they apparently loved it because they've really put a lot of uh, faith into it. That's great. On the film side, is that a project to come? And obviously, we're in the midst of the writers and actors strikes. But is that a future project that uh, you're doing with Vault on the film I mean, side? I, I think, no. The Unnatural Order really is just like a pure comic book, right? Like it's one of those ideas. That I, 
that's right. tricky, you know, like to, to do anywhere else, you know, and that's kind of what I loved about it. I mean, who knows one day we might try, but that's not the, that's not the goal this time. Okay. Well, yeah, let's get into a natural order. Um, this is a, uh, well, I'll let you describe it because, uh, I, I had the pleasure of reading the first issue. Very cool. Thanks. Um, I, I'm always, uh, for, uh, the tropes that you play with in this story, but feel free to describe as much of the story as you'd like to in this first issue. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, an original comic book that we basically, because I work in Hollywood and don't know any other way to do it, I, I call uh, Zero Dark Thirty meets Lord of the Rings. And basically it's uh, it's a book with a big mystery at its core. Like it kind of like there's a big uh, twist in the end of the first issue that kind of turns the world upside down, but it's very much a sword and sorcery book. You know, like there's barbarians and Roman generals and there's an evil druid and there's tree monsters. And it's uh, it's it's pretty fun. Like it's something I've been wanting to do, like I said, for a long time. And it's kind of a mashup of uh, two different genres once you get into it. Indeed. Um, here I've got the I got the cover for the first issue. There it is. Uh, I'm excited. And uh, a neat marketing idea to, I think, gin up interest in the best way that um Vault uh, Vault made this available to stores uh, for, free, for free, and they could kind of choose the 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 list price on the book is four ninety nine, but they can sell it at that price if they want to give it away to readers. They can if they want to make it a buck, whatever. It's really up to the store, right? Yeah, we really wanted to do something for retailers and really be a partner with them. You know, and again, like first issues are tricky. You know, it's not X Men, it's not Spider Man, it's not Superman, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's like, how do you get attention on it? How do you get it in people's hands? You know, because like as as good as it may be, uh, and pretty good, it's pretty good. You know, no, I'm just saying, like, you know, it's like, how do you get people to like, you know, read it? How do you get it in people's hands? And I mean, like comic books ain't cheap these days, you know, and uh, the economy is what it is, but we figured this would be a way to, look, we really believe in the book, you know, like we think people are going to like it, but uh, there's, there's, uh, this seemed like a, look, they called me up. Like I, it wasn't my idea. Like, you know, the guys at Vault is like, Hey, we had this crazy idea. What do you think about just giving away the first issue for free? I'm like, I, I'm not sure about your business model guys. That seems, uh, not in the spirit of making money, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Look, I mean, it's, it's, it, the results, you know, worked like the orders were through the roof and like, we're all pretty excited about it. That's fantastic. Are you, uh, are you going to New York comic con to promote the book at all? If they, uh, they ask me to go, I'll go. I'm, uh, I'll, I'll promote this and sing it from the mountaintops anywhere. I'm welcome. Understood. Um, how'd you hook up with your artist? The guy at Vault found him. He had done a, another book uh, that they were aware of, and they they put him in front of me, and they're like, "This is the guy." And I'm like, I, the minute I looked at the artwork, I'm like, "This this is the guy." Like his uh, his art is gorgeous. Like it's ridiculous. Like and the stuff he's doing in this book, you know, even that first cover you just showed, like it's it's sick. It's been that's the least of it. Like there's stuff coming up in issue two and three, and like the cover for four, it's like this issue with a dragon on the cover of it that's just the most insane thing i've ever seen like i i just want every cover for a poster in my office and they're just uh he's doing incredible work and i mean again like it's not it's it's a crazy book and there's a lot going on so like he's had to do he's had to do a lot of heavy lifting on this and i couldn't be more happy with the result that's awesome i've got um the pdf here and i'm going to show some some images now from it so yeah val rodriguez everybody is uh your artist and there's the there's the people involved and let's see if i can make this a little bigger uh to really show people the beautiful art for the at least i i know i noticed there's a hollywood reporter article where they also uh, show the first couple pages so yeah, yeah man there you, go. you know we got the legionnaires and uh this uh, wonderful tree and uh, where the uh, druid is held captive really Interesting stuff, man. No, there's, um, uh, as you said, not only the Zero Dark Thirty thing, um, without spoiling, there's a bit of a sci-fi bent to uh, to this story as well that I greatly appreciate. So, yeah, pretty neat stuff, man. Yeah, like the tagline we always played with was like, everybody wants to change the world, you know? So like, you know, like throughout the issue, like everyone's got kind of a sense that things aren't quite right. Things aren't exactly the way they're supposed to be. 
And as you uh, keep reading, hopefully you'll see that, no, things are very, very wrong. And this is not the way the world is supposed to be. So, you know, like it's a bit of a mystery as to like, you know, what's going on and what happened. But, you know, like once you get to issue two, we we kind of explain it all and then, you know, just kind of hit the ground running. So hopefully uh, a, a free first issue hooks people and, um, you know, they can keep uh, digging into the mystery of it. Five issues, six issues for uh, the story arc ongoing. What it's, are we looking at? It's look, it's I'll write it as long as people read it. You know, at the end of the day, like the first four issues are there's it's one story arc, but um, those issues are oversized. So the first issue is 30 pages, two, three, and four are 40 pages each. You know, so wow. you're going to get in that first arc, you're going to get, I'm no mathematician, but you know, like 150 odd pages of story. That's great. And and still at $4.99 for uh, the cover price. Uh, I believe that's correct, but uh, don't quote me on that. Fair enough. I understand. And again, we'll see what your local store says, everybody, in terms of uh, if uh, they hand it out to you or if, uh, you know, they, they uh, give you a reasonable price on it. Oh, that's nice. Zach Goyette says, hey, Chris and John. Hey. Thank you very much. And and I and I must say, Chris, because uh, I want to give people the chance to ask you questions. But I've had several people, both on my Patreon page and uh, guys like Zero uh, here, who says uh, you have one of the most underrated runs of comics ever with your Kane Sc Scarlet Spider. I've been saying that for a long time. No, I, I appreciate that. I, I love that run. I, I love Kane. I love, uh, I, yeah, I miss writing them. No, that was great. 25 issues, man. Now that's a hell of a story that you told with Kane. I, you know, uh, like for, yeah. uh, for a Kane book, it was a pretty good run. That's that's excellent, man. No, very, very cool. And uh, Tamor wants to point out that uh, he really enjoyed uh, your various TV work, Thanks. including uh, what you did on Mandalorian season one, which is very nice. So that was uh, that was about a to work on. That was a crazy, crazy show. But people people seem to like it. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think Mandalorian's doing fine. Um have uh how are how are things for you during the the writer's strike i mean you know as as you know what do you, if you're willing to share any you know thoughts on the situation it'd be great to hear your point of view yeah the situation was necessary you know but obviously like everybody wants to work you know like everybody wants to be writing everybody wants to be creating you know like i mean this is not something we would choose to do lightly you know but uh the world changed, you know, like the medium changed with the advent of streaming and all the issues with AI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone knows the drill. But I mean, like we didn't nobody's like, you know what? I'd like to not make money for half a year. That'd be cool. Like nobody nobody's super excited about that. But, it, you know, like things had to change. Absolutely. And I remember it, in fact, was doing Word Balloon on the last writer strike back in 06 and 07. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, and again. Unfortunately, much like this current strike, the issue was DVDs and proper compensation for the DVD market. And now, as you say, I mean, that's the thing. There's nothing in the agreement that uh, involves streaming, as I understand it from a layman's standpoint. Yeah. And uh, and like you said, the threat of AI. And it is it's it's really sad because you're a great collaborative writer on uh, not only comics, but also animation and your films as well. And uh, it, it concerns me as all of us, as well as we learn that, um, you know, you're hearing about these mini writer rooms or that uh, writers have to, for free, provide a, uh, you know, a treatment for a story idea before they can start getting paid. I mean, it's, it just seems unfair that they're, uh, the, the, the studios in question and the streamers are asking for a lot of work up front before they're willing, willing to pay you guys for, for the effort that you put into it. It's, uh, it's crazy. Like I, again, like I started in animation, you know, and I did animation for years and years and it wasn't covered by the guild at all, you know, which I, I still don't quite understand, but, uh, you know, then I got into feature like just by, by sheer luck, you know, and, and that was lovely and all. But when I did my first TV job, like I think I worked on it for like a year and a half before anything happened, you know, like you, I, I produced like, you know, like a, 30 page document and like, you know, like did any, any amount of work to get this thing up and running and off the ground and hopefully sell it and hopefully one day get paid for it, you know? And it's, I, you know, like, and everyone told me, well, that's just kind of like the way it is. I'm like, okay, sure. You know? And again, what do I know? But uh, it, it seemed excessive, 
you know, so hopefully the day will come where that will change a little bit. Here, here. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, we'll uh, see. Fingers crossed. No, I understand. Zach uh, wanted to acknowledge your wonderful collaborations with uh, Craig Kyle. And he said, I always wanted Chris and Craig to take over the X-Men line. Amazing X-Men was great. Wolverine and the X-Men is the best adaptation. Of course, uh, during your X-Men years, too, you created uh, X-23, who we've gotten to know over the years, both in comics and film. Uh, yeah, man. No, you guys, you guys, it seemed, were certainly the it guys when it came to uh, writing X-Men. And I certainly remember the buzz uh, when you guys were writing your various X books and New Mutants and the like. Yeah, no, we loved it. And Craig and I still talk, you know, we still hang out and play Fortnite and do all these things. And we're always talking ah. about books. And uh, yeah, like I, I I, wouldn't be surprised if he and I do something else, you know, in the future, possibly the near future. But, um, you know, like, it, again, like we are hardcore X-Men fans from way back in the day. Anybody that read any of our runs, you know, saw us basically pick up plot lines from like the 80s, you know, like left and right. Um we had a blast working on new X-Men, X-Force, X-23. Like these characters are near and dear to our hearts. So we are we are always game for more. Marvel, they know where to find us. Um, Now, Tamura obviously says uh, an amazing thing that X-23 uh, managed to get in Logan. Um, forgive me because I don't mean to get into your business. I hope as the creator of X-23, you got some compensation for them using the character logo. Uh, I believe Craig got a thank you. So disappointing, man. You know, I mean, thank God um, uh, Hugh Jackman kind of guilted Marvel in uh, compensating Len Wein before, uh, before he passed away. Yeah, it's, you know? look, I mean, like, it's it's a flawed system, and hopefully, like, it's changing for the better as, as more and more people are, are aware of the value of these characters and, and can see, like, you know, not only the love that the fans have for them, but, you know, like, how worldwide popular they are. Like, you know, like, you know, again, comic book movies right now, for whatever reason, are the, the dominant form of theatrical entertainment on the planet. You know, like, it's it's the... It, the the time has come, you know, like in, at the end of the day, like the people that create these comic books deserve all the recognition and compensation in the, in the world. But, you know, again, like it is, it is the system it is. You know, I feel like we're almost on the other side of the hill, certainly post Avengers Endgame, but even with the DC product as well. And I worry, I don't, I, I don't think the comic book genre will go away, but I, I always point to the Western and its dominance from the 30s through the 60s. And then there was kind of in the 70s a bit of a cooling off period. And then Silverado got people, it seemed, excited again about Westerns. That movie's but, so good. Um, I love Silverado. Oh, my God. Absolutely, man. Jesus. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm an old Western fan. And when it came out, it was like, hey, somebody figured out how to make – way to go, Lawrence Kasdan. You figured out how to make good, good Westerns again. This is great. But – um. You know, and also not only the 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 Marvel output that you've done, both in animation and film, but also uh, things like Secret Headquarters, which I didn't even realize. And forgive me, Chris, I haven't watched it yet. But the the Owen Wilson movie, um, yeah. right? <laughs> did you were you the writers on that? I did. I uh, I wrote that movie like twelve years ago, and it took me ten years to ah. kind of get it made. And it uh, it was a journey, but like you know, like it it hung out. You know, like generally like. There was something there that people responded to. Uh, it survived the Hollywood system throughout, you know, a decade, and, and it got made. And you know, like I'm super proud of it. Not not everything does get made. Absolutely, man. And of course, Max Steel as well. Sure. But um, where are, um, you know, as as I mean, and I know this isn't your company, but or people you worked for in a film capacity, but um, the remnants of the DC universe that they've been putting out this year uh, before James Gunn gets to come out with Superman legacy and his slate of movies and stuff. I really, I can see people like, you know, there, there is a bit of an oversaturation right now. And I wonder, you know, what your thoughts are and where the, the film, the superhero film genre is currently. I, I'm not a super big believer in oversaturation. Like, honestly, like if, you know, again, like, with what night of the week can't I turn on the TV and watch CSI? You know, like at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, like if it's good, it's going to do well. 
you know, if people respond to it, it's going to do well. Like at the end of the day, like comic book movies are like Westerns. They are like detective movies. Like the, the problem is, it's like, well, what, what are they offering that's different than the last 17? You know, it's just like, why do I want to watch this one? Because it can't just be a superhero movie anymore. A superhero movie is like the backdrop. Like, you know, like what kind of story is this? Like, what does this story have to say? And again, like if it's good, uh, I, I'll watch it. You know, like if it's if it's every single week a new movie comes out that's amazing, I'll take it. I I don't you know again like is there an oversaturation of mediocre movies? Well, that's a different question. Yeah, twelve years. That's right. Yeah, um, yeah it's divorce. <laughs> commenting that it took that long to make it happen. I understand. Yeah. So I mean, again, like right. I. I'll, if I love something, I want it every week. You know, like TV shows, like every week you get a new episode or whatever. I don't feel like, oh, that that show is really oversaturated because I had 22 of them this year. I want it to Isn't be Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting too? Well, and when you say 22, yeah, 22 episodes, the classic network All right, I forgot uh, run for, you know, but yeah, nowadays with streaming and stuff, we're down to 10 and good Lord, uh, over the air networks, beyond the uh, the writers and actors strikes, I think are in a weird place. I mean, hell, we're reading the headlines that Bob Iger is trying to sell ABC. And sadly, I'm an old enough old broadcaster that I remember when Disney bought ABC 30 years ago. Yeah. And now uh, look where we are now. So that's, that's weird. You know, uh, yeah, if you had a comment on that, feel free. Well, no, I mean, like it's business. You know, at the end of the day, like their business model is whatever their business model is. And I... I, I can't speak to it. Like even going back to like the comic book stuff, like I didn't get into comic books so that I could be a savvy businessman and protect my IP, you know, like with copyright laws and what I was just like, I, I don't know how to do that. Sure. Like, I, I, again, like if Disney wants to sell ABC, that's their business, you know, but I mean, again, like it just speaks to the way things have changed, you know, like if they're putting all their Disney eggs into their Disney plus basket, more power to them. Right. But I mean, like it just like, I, the hope is is that it's going to be good you know like that's that's the bar like if it is it good i'll watch it if it's not i won't you know i i appreciate too that with this new comic that you're going away from uh superhero stuff in all unnatural order um you know a, a conscious decision or have you written other things in other genres and we're just kind of seeing unnatural order now as an example of such I, I wanted to do a fantasy book for a long time, you know, just say, and you know, like it, it, I've done my fair share of superhero stories and I'll always love superhero stories and I'll always come back to superheroes. It's surprisingly difficult to create a uh, superhero that uh, really captures the imagination. Uh, I've kind of run out of animals, you know, to put in front of the word man and uh, it's tricky, but you know, like, again, like we, we've done it, you know, like everybody's created stuff, you know, like I've, I've got a handful of creations in my time at Marvel that I'm super proud of, you know, but, uh, and obviously X 23 captured many imaginations and has hung on for many, many years. Um, but it ain't easy. And me, you know, with this story in particular, like it's, you know, the hope is like people will respond to these characters, you know, there's barbarians and sorceresses and all that. Um, but, you know, like the hope is, is that beyond what they can do, you like who they are and are are compelled to follow them. Absolutely. And uh, God, uh, Mr. Rodriguez's art is really gorgeous uh, and, and fits the story quite well. Um, I uh, regarding regarding animation, um, how how do you see animation changing since you broke in? And my God, all those all those great you know, Marvel TV shows that you did, the Avengers and the like, and X-Men and everything that you did uh, were so great. And really, a as an older, you know, nerd uh, that's only a couple of years older than you, it, it I love the fact that animation has gotten broader in terms of who uh, it's made for. And I know that for the longest time, it was a Y7 world. But, you know, examples of like shows like yourselves that, that, you, that you wrote, you know, my God, I mean, adults like him as, as much as kids do, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I mean, like, the, the superhero stuff that Craig and I did and then the Avengers show that I worked on, like, at the end of the day, like, it really was just, like, us, like, being like, oh, my God, we love these stories, we love these comic books, like, we really want to show, like, you know, like, people, like, what we loved about them, 
you know, like we wanted to take, like, we were lucky that we could cherry pick, like, the best stories in all of comics and just, like, create an animated series out of it, you know? So, you know, with Craig on X-Men that I worked on a little bit and with me on Avengers, like, you know, like, it really was, like, a little mini golden age that we could kind of do anything we wanted. Like, you know, Marvel animation wasn't, you know, like, it was, it was a fairly small operation back in the day, you know? So we didn't have a ton of oversight. Um, so we just told the stories we kind of wanted to tell, and it, it worked out okay. You know, I think that um, it's probably a little harder today, but um, but to the point about animation as a medium, like, it's never been better. My God, like, you look at stuff like Spider-Verse or Mitchells versus the Machines or, like, Ninja Turtles. Like, I think the amazing thing about animation, and I just had this conversation today about something else, but, I mean, like, it can be a visionary medium. Like, it can be, like, you can do stuff visually that you just can't do in live action. Like, you can, like, really, like, take advantage of animation itself and do something visually like stunning like spider-verse is a visually stunning movie that like really like embraces like its comic book roots in a, an amazing perfect way you know like at the end of the day like i love the avengers movies i love everything that marvel puts out etc cetera, etc cetera. but like you know like i don't spider-verse is just, it's fantastic i'm so with you man and and it is great that as you say um the studios are finally getting hip to the, the American studios of what the Japanese have known for decades. For sure. And I, and I think, so. yeah, I think it's so great. Uh, Tamur and uh, on Patreon, my buddy Tom Evans uh, wanted to know, pumped about the tales of the Teenage Mutant Ninja cartoon that you're involved in. It's the third Ninja Turtle series you've worked on. Uh, Tamir says he guesses he can't, you can't say much, but curious about the differences with each series. Um, yeah, like I've had a long history of the turtles. Like I honestly wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the 2003 Ninja Turtle series. Like I was ready to, uh, to pack it up and like head back to Michigan, but, uh, turtles kept me, uh, kept me in the game, you know? So like, I'll always be grateful to it. I'll, I'll always love it. You know, there's, uh, and then, uh, the 2012 show, uh, I, I knew Ciro Nielli who worked on Avengers with me, uh, and, and. They were kind enough to say, hey, do you want to come in and play? And I, I did for an episode. But then um, this one, the one that uh, Tails, uh, is based on the, the Seth Rogen uh, movie that just came out, uh, Mutant Mayhem. And it, it more or less lives in the world of Seth Rogen's Ninja Turtles. So no, I can't say a ton. Uh, the logo, I think, just got revealed and potentially like a, an air date. But um, it's a lot of fun, and I'm excited for people to see it. But yeah, it very much is is Seth Rogen's kind of version of the turtles. Well, you know, I've I've really enjoyed everything that he's done in the comic book world, like Preacher and The Boys, and and now Ninja Turtles. I haven't seen the movie yet. It's funny that we're talking today because I got a, an email blast uh, from Paramount Plus saying, "Hey, you know, the movie's uh, movie streaming now on Paramount Plus." So, you know, there's that. It's, again, like I, I already got the job, so I'm not just saying it, but I mean, like, it's great. Like, you know, like it really leans into the teenage of, of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and like the boys are great. And, you know, Seth Rogen is a, a pretty funny guy, you know, like it's a oh, absolutely. Of- yeah. And he clearly loves comics and really understands the, you know, the what makes each property that he works on great. Love the boys, love Preacher. I have no doubt that I'll love this uh, Ninja Turtles uh, movie. Um, Zach wanted to know regarding, uh, again, your greatest hits at Marvel. And uh, he's like, do you have any more X-23 stories in you? Mike Choi has said he would only come back to X-23 if it was you and Craig writing. I know I'm not the only person that would be excited about that. I got to tell you, man, Mike Choi, one of my one of my favorite people in comics. I, I've known him a long time. And what a brilliant artist he is. We've been so fortunate to work with amazing artists, like our, our entire run. Like, you know, at the end of the day, like Joey's phenomenal, like Billy Tan, fantastic. Like, you know, like we yeah. worked with Scotty Young and Mark Brooks and like uh, Clayton Crane. And like, it's just like, we, it's an embarrassment of riches, you know? So do Craig and I talk about more X-23 stories? Absolutely we do. Oh, wow. Well, there you go, man. You got to tap Choi and uh, the, the get the band back together. That would be fantastic. So Zero says he loves the 2003 Turtles so much as well. Yeah. So that's nice to hear. Very cool. I did, uh, I did like 17 episodes of that series. Wow. Jesus. 
And Mandalorian, great experience in the first season, writing that episode and everything. Yeah, it was a fantastic experience. Uh, I was lucky enough to work on a, a show at Lucasfilm called Star Wars Rebels. And, you know, from there, like, yes. uh, met with Dave Filoni and he and I hit it off and just kept kept the conversation going. And and then they, they were working up uh, development on this thing uh, that was based on a Mandalorian character and... It was just like it was like it was a crazy like train of how fast it went. But uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to work on the first season of Mandalorian, like help develop it and uh, wrote an episode. And and Ahsoka, obviously, the current live action show that's happening on, on Disney Plus uh, certainly has echoes of Rebels in it. And uh, that's that's great. And I think it only elevates uh, the greatness of the Rebels series. It's super surreal to watch it, like having worked on the animated series and then watching Ahsoka. And, and Floney had told me bits and pieces of it here and there over the years. But like to see it come to life like that's just been nuts. Like it's it's fantastic. That's cool. Regarding things like Max Steel and Secret Hideout, um, because obviously, you know, there is a built in audience for the DC and Marvel stuff when it goes into television or film. Um, are studios still... Um, you know, kind of interested in, hey, let's try and create our own superhero thing. Sure, absolutely, they are. Like at the end of the day, like you know, like everybody, everybody wants that thing that everybody likes, you know, and like people like superheroes. At the end of the day, like I think the, the, the tricky part is if you're going to do like I'm going to do a five million dollar Max Steel movie, you know, like the problem is with a small movie like that, whether whether it's good or not, like it doesn't really matter, but it is going to get compared to the $200 million Avengers movie. So even, even if you put it together with duct tape and $5 and a, a hope and a dream, like it's still going to be a bit lumped together with the Marvel and DC stuff, you know, like secret headquarters, like had more money, certainly. But I mean, like that was always meant to be a, kind of a self-contained small family movie, like for kids, but you know, like, and it's, it's fine. Like it's, it's fair enough. Like they're both superhero movies, you know, but, but it is, it is kind of a rough, comparison from like you know like the marvel machine which i love and i've been part of but like they have they've got slightly bigger budgets than we do but you know again like that. oh go ahead no no no. please finish your thought uh secret headquarters like i i think like did everything i wanted to do like it's fun and charming and owen wilson's great and the kids are great and walker scobell has gone on to go be percy jackson and like it's it's um it, yeah, I'm super happy with it. You know, like it's uh, again, like it's it's to get something made in this town is a miracle. So uh, if if that's the last thing I ever do, I'll take that miracle. Well, and further from that, uh, uh, fellow Chicago and William Friedkin, I always love what he said about making movies where to have a successful movie, a thousand things have to go right. Right. And I think that's that's really words to live by, and uh, certainly. Uh, from my perspective, when I get to go behind the scenes, talk to people like yourself, you learn more and more about that. I, I wanted to ask you about the Thor movies, both the Dark World and certainly Ragnarok. And, um, you know, it. Uh, I, I will admit that, and I really did enjoy Dark World, but I, I, I thought Ragnarok was really just elevating the Thor property even more. Um, you know, any, any fun experiences that you want to relate in terms of uh, making those movies? You know, I think that at the end of the day, like, uh, just the idea of what the Marvel movies could be was kind of evolving, you know? Like, so as as Thor 2 was kind of happening, Guardians was kind of happening, and, like, the idea that, oh, we could be fun, you know? Like, kind of, like, happened in the middle of it. Because at first, we were like, we're going to be a very serious movie, and we're going to wring some hands, sure. and we're going to be, you know, like... <laughs> And then kind of halfway through, we're just like, well, that's not the funnest thing in the world. Like Guardians guys are like having a lot more fun than we are. So, you know, it was it was just like, you know, like and Kenneth Branagh did it in Thor 1. Like there's moments in that movie where it's a ton of fun, you know. So like we're just like, let's embrace that. Let's lean into it. And and Thor the Dark World was, you know, like uh, I'm proud of it. You know, but it, it definitely was an evolution yeah. in kind of like how the character could be. And by the time we got to Ragnarok, like it felt like we found a good balance between and again, like all credit in the world to Taika Waititi and, and Craig and Eric Pearson, like it all kind of like came together and found that kind of magic alchemy, you know, that, uh, you know, like is, is, is what makes these things work. What I really liked about the Dark World, too, 
was the element of science fiction wrapped in the North Norse mythology. And uh, there were times where even just wordless scenes of like the, the, the spacecrafts that, uh, that they were using as they, as they went along, you know, the, the dark world. And it's just like, I like that. And then of course, as you say, the evolution of Ragnarok with, with going back to more humor. I mean, yeah. I mean, and, and really, uh, you know, putting the Hulk and Thor together. And I know too, that um, there's the planet Hulk element that sure. Greg Pak had obviously in his comics that you guys leaned on for your story as well. You know, it's, I would love to see you. Uh, and, and did you ever have the opportunities to uh, write the Thor comic? No, I think I had Thor like guest star in an issue of like uh, avenging Spider-Man, you know, but I mean, I think okay. that, uh, I've never written a Thor proper comic. Um, which, you know, it's fine. Like I've done a ton of X-Men and a ton of Spider-Man and I did Avengers. Certainly Thor was in a billion episodes of, of the show, but, uh, but yeah, I don't, yeah. It's, I, I don't think about these things. I just take them as they come. You know, the, am I right? You worked on both Avengers series, right? Or Smitey's Heroes and I forget what the uh, other title for the other Avengers, right? Didn't you work on both? No, just, uh, just the Earth's Mightiest oh. Heroes. So the uh, the okay. follow up series uh, that that Jeff Loeb and Man of Action did was Avengers Assemble, and that kind of was uh, I, I think cued a little closer to the movies if I'm recalling correctly. Uh, Zach, another great question, and let's jump to DC. I have to jump across the street and show some love for your Red, Ro Red Robin run. Pardon me. You have a great voice for Tim Drake. What kind of differences? Did you notice between the two companies on and off the page? You know, it's funny, right? Because I, I was always a Marvel guy and I, I love me some Marvel and I didn't start reading DC until like a little later. Um, I, I didn't approach it any differently, really. Like, you know, the only thing that I, Mike Martz, who is my editor on uh, over at Marvel, switched over to DC and he and I kept in touch and he's like, hey, come over and do some DC stuff. I'm like, great. I really want to like do something with like kids and powers. <clears throat> and he's like, well, I can do half of that. So, you know, like I, I ended up on poor powerless Tim Drake and uh, you know, it's funny. A lot of the stuff I do and everybody does, because that's just the name of the game is just like, all right, you're going to write the Robin book, but we're kind of in the middle of a thing, but it's going to be fine. And I'm like, all right, sure. And it's like, all right, you're going to write Robin, but Batman's dead. I'm like, oh, but he's not really dead. And it was like, I did like a Spider-Man book and like Steve Wacker was like, hey, do you want to write Spider-Man? I'm like, sure. He's my favorite character. I want to write Spider-Man. He's like, great. Hold that thought. And it's like, hey, you're going to write Spider-Man, but it, it's really Dr. Octopus. I'm like, oh, <laughs> all right. Yes, there is Spider-Man. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then it was like, you're going to write Spider-Man, but Spider-Man's clone. You're gonna, it's right. like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's, I don't know why, but I do a lot of clones. I do a lot of, uh, a lot of side picks. <laughs> And I'm happy to do it. I, I love it. Getting in the head of Superior Spider-Man, who, who of course was Doctor Octopus in, in Peter's body. Um, yeah, I mean that's you're you're playing with two things at once there. I mean, obviously his motivation is very different from Peter Parker's motivations, but you know he's 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 Spider-Man for the moment. So yeah, what was and also a uh, Kane being you know Peter's clone. And again, uh, we said it earlier. Uh, what a story, man. I, I just really think, and again, like Kane's whole, you know, reason of, of being and everything and trying to be a good guy during that run, but also, you know, leaning into the dark side as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, yeah. it, as you said, you, you wanted to write these characters proper, but then the opportunity comes to write these variations. And, in you know, ways, really, you it, it's more interesting in a lot of ways. Cause like, you know, Spider-Man's a hero and he's always going to be a hero. Kane, terrible hero like you know like he's basically like even after he kind of made his turn he's just like i'm not a hero through and through i'm a monster and had to be dragged kicking and screaming into herodom you know like at the end of the day like he was all about self-loathing more than anything else and like you know like the idea that there could be a hero inside of him was an impossible idea to him but you know like it was there because genetically it was just there you know and i think that like uh superior spider-man you know like very similarly he was just like arrogant, like, you know, just the arrogance of Otto Octavius, knowing that he could do this better than Peter Parker and knowing that he could be a better hero and just like realizing, oh, this is a little harder than like I thought. Um, 
But, you know, the fun of him was just like he was so mustache twirling, even about trying to do good things. You know, like, sure. he just, like he's just such a prick about it. Um, it was it was fun. So you get to you, like uh, you have to extra, you know, like you get to exercise different muscles and you get to play different facets of the thing that you couldn't necessarily do on the main books. Like that's the great thing about like the satellite titles and the books that get canceled after six issues is like you can probably have a lot more fun. Um, you had Wacker, obviously, as your editor, and certainly he knew everything inside and out of what was going on in, in the various Spider books. Did you ever talk to Slot about uh, Superior Spider Spider Man at all? Yeah, for sure. Like he and I kind of connected like just when it first started and he kind of explained like what he's doing and where he's coming from and where it's going and all that. And like, you know, again, like I, you know, like I grew up in like the system of like the Marvel movies and the Star Wars stuff. And like, you know, like I, I, I it's a shared sandbox, you know, so like I, I had no illusions like Dan was doing the main book, you know, so like I'm just there to kind of have fun on the side and I, I'm not going to break the toys and I'm going to put him back the way I found him. And Dan's going to like do his story. So he and I communicated and, uh, you know, just like he wasn't going to use like the, like the, the, the standard Spider-Man villains for like a bunch of it. So like I did a Sinister Six story that kind of like went for a good chunk of that book. Scarlet Spider was easy because we took him out of New York, you know, like it was just like, there wasn't going to be yeah. a real crossover there. He's down in Houston, but I got to do stuff like the, um, you know, I played with rocks on, I created new stuff. I did assassins guild stuff. Like it was, you can still have fun. Absolutely. Um, Oh, this is interesting from Zach. Uh, let me pop that up. There it is. Uh, I know not all can be, but do you think villains should be redeemed? Mostly? No. Like at the end of the day, like it's interesting once in, in a while, but at the end of the day, like if all the villains turn into heroes, it's just like, I want somebody to fight. You know, like I, I'm all for Magneto going back and forth here and there, but like, I, you know, like I, I, I like me some good villains, you know, and if they all end up working with, with the various heroes, like, I don't know, like, again, like I, I can see it both ways, but you know, like I need some villains. Sure. Well, and also in the case of Magneto, we really understood his motivations as the character became more complex. And, and certainly he thinks he's the hero of sure. his own story. I, I don't know if, um, God, I, I'm trying to think of like a, you know, uh, the, uh, the trapster is really <laughs> thinking he's the hero. of yeah, his own like story. Give, me, give me a good, like unrepentant, like villain. It's just like, who knows they're the villain. And it's just like, yeah, like I like to hurt people like saber tooth. Like, you know, like you can always kind of be like, I can depend on saber tooth, just like kill people. Like, and be happy about it. Like, it's his hobby. You know, like, I, yeah, like, I, I, I agree. Not every villain needs to be redeemed. Uh, Timur uh, seems to remember that you pitched in and wrote a few Amazing Spider-Man issues with Dan Slott when he needed a co-writer uh, to help. Yeah, I, look, Dan Slott, I think at that point in time, is writing 10,000 issues a month of, 47 different Spider-Man books. Like, uh, again, like he plotted out the little things and I just like basically like broke it down into panels and did dialogue, you know, like it wasn't, it wasn't exactly uh, a ton of heavy lifting on my part, but I was happy to help out. I did it once for Chris Claremont too. And that was really exciting. It was not. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like he was just having some issues and, uh, and I was uh, asked to pitch in some dialogue for some new Excalibur issues. And it was like, I was all, all excited. You and Craig Kyle were such a great team on all the X books that you guys did together. How did the writing process work between the two of you? There's a lot of lunches. Like generally we just go out to lunch and we'd have our little notebooks and we'd just like talk, you know, like story, you know, and we'd like drum up the story together and I'd, I'd go off and like write up something and he'd, you know, write on it and we'd pass it back and forth. And it was a lot of fun. Like, you know, like he's, uh, he's, one of my favorite people on the planet because like he's not only a, a tremendous like idea machine um but he's uh, a tremendously funny human being like he uh truly can can make me laugh so i i love working with craig that's great man and uh did you guys so you would like the whole story you would pass back and forth because i know brew baker and rucka when they were doing gotham central they almost did like all right, you do the first half of the book. I'll do the second half of the book. 
things we like didn't that. Really that. Like that. Like I think that um, look, we both have other stuff going on, and very like he's an executive at Marvel half the time that we're doing stuff, and like he's worked uh, on on a ton of stuff that he can't actually talk about. But like he, you know, like we're both busy with a ton of stuff. So like you know, like it's like if. If I'm having a light week, I do something. If he's having a light week, he do something. Like it was just dependent. But I mean, like it, it all came out in the wash. It yeah. absolutely did, and it was fantastic. Yeah, man. Um, are you? I uh, you know with uh, unnatural. Um, here, I'm going to bring it back up, so I don't screw up the title. Unnatural order. I was going to say unnatural selection. Unnatural order. Uh, again, a different genre. Uh, first of uh, more uh, comic book uh, stuff from you. Uh, coming up soon i don't want you to announce anything that isn't ready to be announced but just in general yeah i mean again like i love comic books i'll always want to be doing comic books like i think that just like life prevented it for like a little bit of chunk of time but uh but yeah like i i i always want to have a comic book cooking even if it's just an idea um because it's it's just between animation and tv and feature like it's my favorite medium to write i don't know why i just like i love writing it and I mean, again, like it's uh, as a lifelong comic book fan, like going to the store and seeing a comic book with your name on it's pretty great. Are there any? Uh, and I don't because I, I don't want to ask you the usual question of are there any characters you haven't written that you want to? I'm sure there are, and I don't want you to do that. But as a kid growing up, were there the oddball? You know, maybe uh, Hellstorm or uh, you know some of the other like you know lower level uh, Marvel or DC characters. Like you know, I'm a I'm a sucker for Metamorpho on the DC side. Yeah. Or uh, you know, I I love any I love any Nick Fury Shield books. They sure. always have me at hello when they they bring Shield back. But yeah, what were some of the off brand uh, or you know lower lower tiered heroes? I always you liked as a and again they're not lower tier, but like I always felt I could write uh, Teen Titans pretty well. Like I I felt I have. Oh, a that'd be great. Sure. I've never, I've never written Superman. I've never written Wonder Woman. I've sort of written Batman, uh, but uh, yes. but Dick Grayson. You know, like I've I've written on uh, like a Batman animated series, but um, but I I've, I've never written them in the comic books. So like I just to just do it. Like I've been trying to drum up a Superman story just to just to oh, just wow. to just to try it. And he's uh he's. You know, again, like he's the premier superhero. He's fantastic. So we'll see. We'll see if it uh, anything comes of it. That's Craig Kelly, meanwhile, had an idea that just knocked me off my socks. Like, uh, I, I well, we're going to find a way to bring that to the light. Outstanding. And I could totally see you, given what you did with uh, the New Warriors. It would be great to see you uh, do the Titans book. I think that would be amazing. Uh, um, me too. Here's hoping, man. Absolutely. Zach wants to know uh, who your favorite uh, three uh, uh, X-Men. Your top three X-Men. I'm a big Jean Grey fan. I'm a big Cyclops fan. And I was always a big uh, Nightcrawler fan. Um, I, I would take all of the New Mutants over those three. And I would take most of the New X-Men over them. Uh, I, I fell in love with the New X-Men kids uh, hardcore like they're their favorites of mine but you know back in the day like the i started reading uncanny with like 187 uh so like it was like the full-on like storm mohawk nightcrawler you know shadow cat kind of era um so those are always kind of like my x-men uh love gambit you know love love rogue uh, but yeah very much that era is is my my sweet spot give me a good Thank mutant you. master any day oh that's excellent uh, do you, I mean, uh, you forgive me, man, because really we're in the same age group. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, like, do you stay in touch with DC and Marvel, the, the current groups of editors so that you can pitch no. to the big two? It? Well, and I, I need to do a better job of it, but I just like, I've been kind of wrapped up in a bunch of um, other stuff. So uh, yeah. Craig and I are, have been talking to Marvel recently about something, but, uh, but I, not not uh, as much, but I would love to DC if you're listening. Hey, that's all. Yeah. I'd certainly love to see more DC work from you. And obviously CB knows who you are. He knows CB who you knows are. You are. Like so, I would say, absolutely. They've got our number. And again, like I, if I, like I have a cloak and dagger pitch, I want to talk to him about, but you know, it's just like, it's time permitting. Um, but it's um, yeah, I, I, I need to, 
look, if, when Craig and I sit down and get serious about um, the thing that we can't talk about, um, we'll we'll make it happen. I'm excited, man. That's good. You'll be you'll be hearing from me once the announcement is made of whatever you guys got cooking, and you got to put in a word for uh, me with uh, with Craig. I'd love to talk to Craig at some point as well. For sure. That that's that's so great to hear, man. Because truly, um, we're listen. It's great that you've been making movies. It's great that you've been making television. It's great that you've been making animation. But yeah, man, you know, as a comic book reader, we've we've missed you both, and it would be great to to see you, whether it's solo or with Craig. You know, come back and uh, and do more stuff. And and again, uh, as as long as well as Unnatural Order, uh, that's why God, when uh, when David from Vault told me that uh, you know you were doing this, I'm like, yes, please. My I, like I told you, man, earlier on, it's like I've been wanting to talk to you for years. So it's wonderful that you're back, man. Thank you. No, I'm excited to be on. I, I like I I talk about comic books all day. I, I love it. <laughs> That's cool. I worry about the price of comics, as we said earlier. And again, we'll point out that um, you might get a great deal on Unnatural Order depending on your store. So everybody in October really needs to go and see what you get. But I worry about that because we want again, much like the writer strike with film and television, we want you guys properly compensated. But I got to say, man, I, you know, the $5 comic, you and I know, I mean, hell, I'm assuming you and I were from the uh, 35 or uh, 40 cent era. I, I was certainly, I go back to the 20 cent era. I'll admit that. I know. So. I, I definitely read 35 cent era, but I, when I got serious about like, I'm going to collect, like, I think I was at 65 cents. Okay. 65 cents for a <laughs> book. And I remember like my first dollar comic, I was like outraged. I'm like, this is too much. Nobody's ever going to buy a dollar comic book. Like this is the death of the industry. <laughs> as I as I sit here hawking my five dollar comic book. No, oh, you know, again, what are you gonna do? No, you know, God, I had that conversation with uh Dan Buckley when it was two ninety nine. And yeah. I'm like, three bucks for a comic, really? It's a lot. Really? And you know, I hear you, man. Would you ever and I'm glad that Vault wanted to to back you on Unnatural Order, uh any ideas that you'd want to bring to image? And and do a creator own book again. I'm glad that Vault is uh, willing to be a partner in this uh, venture. I did one image book. The only other creator own comic book I ever did is called Killer of Demons, and it was a three issue original that I did at Image, and uh, I love it. And I would certainly uh, do more of it. So we're we're actually developing it as a television series right now, and uh, and we'll see, you know. But hopefully one day there'll be more Killer of Demons which was really kind of like a horror comedy, but without much horror. It was just a comedy. <laughs> that sounds good, man. That's excellent. That's great, Chris. And truly, I'm glad that um, the stu uh, when when the studio stops striking with the writers, that you're, you've got the pipeline and that uh, they're listening to you. And, and it is weird that animation isn't affected by the strike. And I know it's a different guild. It's a different uh, guild, but yeah, the animation guild. And even though it's writing, it's it's for whatever reason it's covered by the animation guild. So it is what it is. Yeah, I hear you. I you know another thing, and again, I know it's affected by uh, the WGA strike currently. But I've really loved that uh, both DC and Marvel have embraced audio, and I'm like beyond being a comic book nerd and a you know genre nerd and stuff. I am a sucker for great audio production. And I wonder if you ever considered writing for audio because it, I think has the same benefits that animation does where it's, you know, really sound effects and imagination are the only things keeping you from telling whatever stories you want to tell. You know, like, it's funny, right? Cause like I, I was trying to adapt a, like a, a pod series, a podcast. I don't know what you call it, but um, yeah, yeah, no, Sure. They're basically like radio plays. Like I, you know, it's like, work, you know, like, and I, I remember thinking to myself, could I do this? Cause I look, I've written animation. I've written features. I've written animated features. I've written TV. I've written stuff, you know, but like, yeah. Why? Like I was going to sit down and write like a short story, like a novel, like a little novella. And then I got to, I got to new document and pretty much stopped. Cause I'm like, I, that's a, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. Like it, it was just like it's a, it was a weird like structural thing where I just like my brain broke. It's like oh my god, I had to I had to write extra sentences. Like I couldn't figure it out. Um, but I, I have not considered doing like an audio production. But uh, but I, I've listened to a few and they're pretty cool. Like it's pretty amazing. Like kind of what they can put together. I so agree, man. And it's been fun 
talking to the various comic book people that have done uh, podcast audio drama for DC and Marvel in recent years. I, th- I think it's great. And yeah, man, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an old time radio sucker. I love the Gunsmoke Western show and Dragnet. Mm. And my God, I'm a film noir buff as far as film. And there were so many great radio noir detective series that were in that style. And, you know, yeah, so I, I, I'm i really thrilled that modern audio has gotten as far as it has. Uh, Zach wants to know, does Marvel view animation different from DC? Outside of your time with Craig and Greg Weissman, animation is the one area where DC seems to dominate, not Marvel. I think, uh, you know, again, like I, I've written, I wrote like on a Batman series, like I have pitched like stuff to Alan Burnett over there before. Like, I don't know that they view it differently, but they, they certainly seem more committed to it. You know, like they, they really like started cranking out like the, the DVD movies or we used to call them direct to DVD, but now they're just animated movies. Uh, yep. And they do a ton of them like, and they're great, you know, and they get amazing casts and amazing animation and like they, they have their machine going and it's awesome. Like I, I would love to see more animation from Marvel because like I said, you know, like you look at stuff like spider verse and what if, and like, you know, like give me more. I, I just like, I love that stuff and I want more of it. And I know that they, you know, like are being careful, being more careful in like how they structure stuff and like everything being connected and all that stuff. But like, I, as a fan, I just want to watch it. You know, like, uh, I'd certainly be happy to make it, but, um, but you know, like, I just, like, I want to see more of that stuff in the world. Well, I certainly think truly that your, your Marvel animation back when it seemed like DC was a bit more dominant, the great thing was things like Earth's Mightiest Heroes uh, was, was a great exception of, no, that's a, that's a great cartoon. And obviously you guys knew what you were doing. So it was great to see that you guys did that. And, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it would be great to see you guys do uh, you do more uh, animation for Marvel or DC or whomever. Well, what I was doing was chasing Justice League, you know, like the great Dwayne McDuffie. And like, you know, in that show, it's just like, I, I, I'm going to try to do that. You know, like that, that was the bar for me. Obviously, Batman, the animated series was ever beloved. But Justice League for me, it was just like, oh, dang, like, you know, like the greatest heroes in the world all together telling the greatest stories. Like, give me that for Avengers. And we, we tried our best, you know, like, so, um, yeah, DC definitely had like a ton of great people doing a ton of great stuff. So like, I, we were always chasing that a little bit, but you know, like we were Marvel too. So we wanted to do it the Marvel way. So, sure. um, but you know, like hopefully, hopefully more will be coming. You know, um, I felt justice league action just didn't find the right audience. And obviously, Cartoon Network didn't do it many favors. I don't know about on the West Coast, but at least here in the Midwest, it was on at like 6 a.m. or whatever. Yeah. But I was really impressed how much story they were able to put in when you got rid of the commercials and the opening. They essentially were nine or ten minute scripts at most. And, and they were, the super length, fun. They they were super excellent. Fun, like, highlighted they were like, fun characters. Like it was fantastic. Um, I yeah. again, like there's bigger decisions corporately sometimes that come into play on these things that tend to mess things up. I remember I worked on a Fantastic Four show called Fantastic Four World's Greatest Heroes. And I'm like, yes, yeah, you did. Four. And like, where's this going to air? They're like Cartoon Network. I'm like, isn't that owned by uh, yeah. Warner Brothers? Yeah, and they're like, yeah, but it should be fine. And like it, it aired at like midnight. <laughs> it was like it was crazy thing I, like nobody ever saw the show you know and again like it was a more comedic take on it but uh i remember like it ended up airing at midnight and i'm just like what <laughs> Touché. Touché. <laughs> uh, was, anyway it is what it is well bringing up justice league action i wondered that it's the shorter format it's not a 20 minute half hour you know thing i mean you know so you know, um, could you could you write? Do you think you could write that kind of short form? Because every it seems to me, it's funny that I think in both live action, you know, um, was it Quibi tried yeah. to do short form live action and stuff, and and certainly animation, as we know, traditionally going back to Disney and Warner Brothers. I mean, that's where and and, and MGM for that matter. That's where animation lived was you know a ten minute short and everything. So yeah, any thoughts on the length of uh, stories? And I think, look, at the end of the day, like there's, I remember I talked about it 
I don't know. I don't know. I talked about it at some point. There's this one amazing like SNL digital short that like the Lonely Island guys did. And it was called, I think it was like the curse or something. And it was like Andy Samberg, okay. like it was like a Stephen King thing where he stepped on like the the dream catcher of like a guy on the street. And like it, I think it was like three and a half minutes long. And like, it, I was, it was amazing. And John Hamm was in it. And it was, uh, it was the best thing ever. And uh, I think that it doesn't matter how long it is. And you can tell a great story. And, you know, again, like it, it really is just a, like, you know, like, yeah, it doesn't matter the length. It doesn't matter the format. Creative people are going to find a way to tell like a fun, great story that like makes you want more. You know, and I think that like, yeah, we're used to 22 minutes, you know, because you got eight minutes of commercials, you know, and like I, I, I think it, it truly doesn't matter. You know, like I think comic books even have gone from like 22 pages to 20 pages to 18 pages or whatever they are now. And you still find a way to tell a great story. And like, you know, like it's it's always going to be fine. We're going to be watching all our shows on Snapchat and it's going to be fine. You know, like people will find a way to tell a great story. I'm with you, man. Zach, by the way, says he loved the FF uh, series. The anime art works so well with uh, the stories, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, we had a blast on that show. Craig and I, he was the executive on it. He and I would just sit down and like throw ideas at each other. And like, we had a ton of fun. Like we did, uh, you know, again, like that show, definitely lean comedy and that's not always what the fans want, but you know, like it entertained us. Is the series on Disney plus? It is. Yeah. You can find it on Disney plus. Oh, that's great. Like oh, my man. Well, I probably... X-Men have yeah. well, one there. I... Fantastic four is on there. I think Wolverine, the X-Men is Avengers definitely is like, you, you can like the Hulk versus Wolverine is on there. Maybe next Avengers, but yeah, I, yes. I, I got a lot of catalog in the old Disney plus. That's great to hear. And yes, I loved uh, the Hulk versus Wolverine adaptation. I thought you did a hell of a job on that. And Thanks. that's that's great to hear. Well, I promise you, when we, t I hopefully we will talk another time. I'd love to have you back. And um, uh, you know, I will uh, I will make sure that I watch the FF uh, cartoon, knowing that it's on Disney Plus. But right, right now, uh, case in point, it's Unnatural Order uh, from Vault. The first issue comes out in October, and depending on the story, you might want to hunt around if you're in a city like new york or chicago where there are plenty of options of stores to choose from and you know find find a store that maybe will give it to you for free or give it to you at a reduced price because the vendors got it for free which is a great way to get the word out on the book and uh and give people a real opportunity to sample it and i can speak from uh, experience having read that first issue how how uh, how good the story is and it's definitely intriguing so uh congratulations Thanks. on that absolutely yeah. man mel rodriguez killing it on art like if you like sword and sorcery if you like uh and and then it evolves in a completely different direction like uh, at a certain point and it's uh check it out there's a low cost of entry i'm sure there you go chris honestly great to meet you i'm so glad we had this conversation thank and you as i said not to be a pig i hope you'll i hope you'll come back and we could do it again uh, down thank the road you. i'd love to Thank you. That's that. My pleasure, man. Everybody, thanks for watching. Great questions. Uh, great listening. And uh, I promise you more great word balloon. Next week, I'm going to have uh, Tom King on. Oh, and okay. um, yeah, so Tom's doing good. And uh, geez, now I'm blanking on everyone else I guess lined up for next week. I know I have at least three guests in the book. And I hope to have more before, uh, before uh, ne next week comes upon us. So everyone, thanks for uh, listening and watching. Stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. How was that? One more. Hold on, I'm going to play my clothes.